Good morning. Um, I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's wonderful to be a part of this. Um, and it was great to hear that wonderful talk about Thibodeau. Um, about three years ago, Sam Ratcliffe, who's the head of Bywater Special Collections at SMU, told the Meadows about his conversation with a Mr. Tom Cronin of Houston, who is the great nephew of Marie Cronin, a Texas-based artist. Tom Cronin um, facilitated the donation of the portrait um, of Marie Cronin. You'll see at your left, the woman in white, that's Marie Cronin, by a Spanish artist named Claudio Castellucho. And uh, it was in desperate need of conservation, both the canvas and the frame, when it got to the meadows. And uh, so once it was restored, we were trying to figure out how we would uh, install it. The painting on the left is a portrait of another woman by Marie Cronin. And if you come to the meadows uh, this afternoon, you can see both of these paintings. In thinking about how we should display this new acquisition at the Meadows, I thought about Marie Cronin's artistic career in the early 20th century on two continents. Having studied in Paris with Castelluccio and also having been commissioned to paint portraits of Texas statesmen that have been on display at the Texas State Capitol for over a century. Many of you probably are aware of the Meadows Museum's collection of Spanish art which has grown since it was founded in 1965. Additionally, uh, as we are a university art museum, the Meadows also oversees SMU's university art collection, which began in 1920, or circa 1920. Through generous donations over the years, the university art collection has substantial holdings of Texas and regional art by figures such as Everett Spruce, William Lester, Otis Dozier, Jerry Bywaters, uh, Stella Lamond, uh, the list goes on. Uh, Jerry Bywaters, of course, uh, taught fine art and art history at SMU for over 40 years. So in deciding on our spring 2016 exhibition lineup at the Meadows, we thought that providing context about the life of the Texas-raised artist depicted in Castellucci's portrait would be a nice intersection of our institution's dual profile. The theme of women artists working in Texas in the 20th century provided a perfect segue into the exhibitions of both Carlotta Corcoran and Janet Turner. Although in the university art collection, these two artists are not really represented. We have a couple of prints by Turner. Um, how, we do, however, have a wonderful archive on campus, which I'm sure some of you or many of you are familiar with. The Jerry Bywater Special Collections, headed by Sam Radcliffe, and Ellen Bowie Neewike, who's here this morning. Uh, this was thus an excellent opportunity to work with our wonderful colleagues on campus. Both Corcoran and Turner were highly experimental artists who became masters of unusual and unorthodox methods in photography and printmaking. As professors, Corcoran taught at Texas Women's University for 33 years, and Turner at Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches for nine years before going to um, what is now known as California State University in Chico. Both artists um, brought about change in the concept of art education at their respective institutions and made a measurable impact on their students. Like Cronin, their Texas um, artistic predecessor, if you will, both Corcoran and Turner pushed numerous boundaries, both socially and artistically. It is also noteworthy that both of these artists also championed vehicles of expression other than painting, which I think speaks to sort of a leveling out of the various media in the 20th century. While painting is, was and still is very important, it was no longer the pinnacle of high arts. Janet Turner was an accomplished painter, um, and at times we'll see she treated her prints like paintings, um, but she also vouched for an egalitarian approach, saying, to many printmakers, no medium is considered more or less important than his or her own. The significance lies in the concept. And she often talked about how important printmaking had been in previous centuries, 
Um, but then it became more of a commercial kind of vehicle, and then there was this renaissance in the late 19th century and in the 20th century, and she figured herself in that history. With regard to Corcoran, I like to say that photography found her. She stated that she never liked to paint or draw. This is a quote, it wasn't mine. I couldn't do anything original in it, and I had this intense desire to do something original. Then I picked up a camera and something happened. In Corcoran's hands, the camera was not simply a means of documentation. Rather than capitulate to working in the vein of documentary photography, then prevalent during the Great Depression era, think of Dorothea Lange and her haunting images of migrant workers and their families. Corcoran began to use her camera not to record reality, but rather to capture light itself and its relationship with the forms it encountered. Initially, though, the camera was to Corcoran simply a means to an end. While a faculty member of the University of Cincinnati's School of Applied Arts, Corcoran bought her first camera, a Voigtlander, in 1933, as a teaching aid for her textile design class. She received a Master's of Art in 1926 in art education and fabric design from the Teachers College of Columbia University with the intention of becoming a teacher or fabric designer. She began her teaching career that same year at Women's College of Alabama, which is now Huntington College, and in 1928 took the position in Cincinnati. Prior to that time, uh, Corcoran had been in India she returned to the United States in 1920, um, and she had grown up there. She was the daughter of a missionary surgeon, um, and they had moved there in 1905 from Blue Earth, Minnesota. And there she was educated in English boarding schools in the foothills of the Himalayas. India's uh, visually rich and complex culture remained a lifelong influence on Corcoran. This is... Um, a ceiling of a temple in Rajasthan, a Jain temple, and you have an image of Corcoran to the right. And um, this is an overt comparison. Uh, the lotus blossom is a central motif in Jain and, and Buddhist and Hindu art. But I think when she was over there for 15 years, she was very drawn to all the, the, vegetable, the vegetal and sort of an iconic ornaments that are very central to Indian art. And so when she first started taking photographs, she would take a lot of images of flowers and plant leaves and tendrils. And she used her first camera to take these images, and she wanted her students to look at these and sort of break out of these very staid and rather boring um, motifs that they were creating during the Great Depression era. She wanted to um, help her students innovate their designs. When Corcoran moved to Denton in 1935 to teach advertising design and art history at Texas State College for Women, which is of course now TWU, she was also charged with teaching a photography course. To hone her skills, Corcoran enrolled at Los Angeles' Art Center in the summer of 1936, but she quickly became disenchanted with the utilitarian role the camera was forced to assume in such a straightforward task as taking a picture of a bridge or the Beverly Hills courthouse. And she stated, I could do the regular documentary type of photograph, but somebody else with the same camera and same light could have come up with the same thing. So back in Texas, Corcoran began to explore what she could do with her camera. In her nature studies, um, she sort of developed what she had started in Cincinnati. And you see in these oil tanks, um, these are taken in near Jefferson, Texas. Um, you can see probably the influence of Charles Sheeler um, or Edward Weston. And to the left, um, oops, sorry, this is a more of a straightforward kind of photograph. And to the right, uh, the oil tanks near Jefferson, Texas, this is an image created by two overlapping negatives. So already in the early 40s, she started um, experimenting abstractly, um, creating images 
from reality and then creating her own reality through abstraction. In her next group of works, called Light Drawings, these were created from 1940 to 1943. She would use her camera to record patterns cast by moving lights in spaces as far as far flung as Havana, Dayton Beach, and right here in Dallas. For one set of these light drawings, Corcoran visited the State Fair in Texas. And this image is in the show. Um, she went to the Texas State Fair in Dallas one evening and she talks about what happened. She swung her rolly flex in front of the midway rides and she would make long exposures in the darkness. The artist explained, I'd get into the rhythm of it, I'd swing the camera around and move myself. People thought I was crazy. <laughs> Twelve negatives resulted from this exercise, one of which was a walk in Fair Park, which you see here. And this is from the local collector's collection, um, Carol Howard and George Morton. And in this image, you see how light pulsates organically against the darkness. And talking about her upbringing in India, just for a moment, um, aside from what she saw, um, psychologically, there was this effect that, that took place on her when she was there. She was studying at these boarding schools um, in the English colony of India, but in the boarding schools, they acknowledged very little of the culture there that surrounded them. They, they tried to sort of segregate their students. And so from a very young age, she, Corcoran started to live in sort of a world of her own, and she began to foster independent thought um, there as a little girl. And so she was very happy to work in relative isolation during her first years in Denton. When considering the trajectory of Corcoran's work, though, she really was in the right place at the right time. Rather serendipitously, she came into contact with two leaders of abstract photography and design in the early 1940s. And this was facilitated through two faculty members there in Denton. One was Mary Marshall, here on the left, and she was the head of the art department there. And she saw what Corcoran was doing, and she had a dark room installed there in the art building for Corcoran. Uh, another figure there is, of course, Tony LaSalle. And while she was working on the decorative cycle for TW, TWU's Little Chapel, she became interested in the work of Moholy-Nagy. And um, at the invitation of both of these women, Moholy-Nagy arrived in Denton in 1942 to teach for a semester. And I should note also that um, Corcoran and LaSalle are, I think, um, exceptional because they were sort of investigating this kind of abstract path that a lot of other artists at the time in Texas were not. Under the supervision of Maholi Naj, who was then director of the Institute of Design in Chicago, Corcoran led a light workshop. And this is Maholi Naj here um, teaching his light workshop. Corcoran taught her students to make photograms, images created by placing objects directly on photographic paper that was then exposed to light. Invented separately in 1921 by Maholi Naj and Man Ray, photograms became a useful teaching tool for Corcoran. Beyond this exercise, however, Maholi Naj gave little guidance to Corcoran during his time in Denton. Corcoran later stated that, quote, the advice he gave me, which was so ridiculous in a way, was to photograph the girls who were working their way through school. He didn't understand my need, my desperate need, to work and do something original in photography. In the context of this seemingly dismissive attitude toward Corcoran, it's interesting to note that Maholi Naj included in his publication, Vision in Motion, a photographic study by Corcoran of patterns that an artificial light source created through a glass brick. Um, later on, Corcoran would state, quote, I had no rapport with Maholi Naj. <laughs> Far more influential to Corcoran was Jurgi Kepes, a Hungarian painter, photographer, and graphic designer, and a former colleague of Maholi Naj at the Bauhaus, 
who arrived in Denton in 1944 to teach at North Texas State Teachers College, now of course, University of North Texas, to complete his book, Language of Vision. Kepesh would play a pivotal role in helping Corfin find her own photographic language, which he coined as, quote, light poetry. Corfin worked closely for a year with Kepesh, who encouraged Corfin to continue her exploration of the medium. And Kepesh, of course, um, he was busy in Dallas. He designed the stained glass windows at Temple Emmanuel and did um, some other projects here in Dallas. Kepesh introduced Corcoran to the light box, and you may have seen these light boxes in that image of Maholi Naj. Um, a light box was a device that was developed at the new Bauhaus in Chicago by Nathan Lerner in 1938. The invention was a modified cardboard box, the sides of which were perforated in order to allow spotlights um, in through the sides. And then paper forms and other sort of items could then be suspended through the holes. Um, could be suspended inside from strings and then you could see them through the holes. The exercise taught Corcoran how paper acted as a light modulator. A light modulator was central to her work. Um, it's an object that catches, reflects, and transforms light. Kepesh introduced, instructed her to continue her light box studies until she was able to quote, photograph light instead of paper. Though to Corcoran, her light box investigations were a means to an end, rather than finished works of art, Kepesh reproduced one of her light box images in his book that he was working on at the time, Language of Vision. And Corcoran would later state that Kepesh was, quote, the only influence on her work. Though I think she had a few others, but that's what she said. Corcoran then carried on this principle of light as the medium forward to her other photographic experiments beyond the controlled environment of the light box. She used diverse objects, eggs, paperweights, coral shells, glass, and plaster heads, all acting as her light modulators. Corcoran realized that photographs did not have to be images of anything in particular. Instead, light itself and the dialogue um, it made with forms it encountered would be the object of her photographic investigations. Um, and in 1946, circa, she was working on the next series, which was called Light Follows Form. And she created these wonderful images. And um, she created them using just images. Um, and Venetian blinds um, were what acted as her light modulator. And she talked about these, these heads. Um, and it's kind of funny. She was a funny lady. Um, she was working in Denton and um, teaching her students. And there was a plaster head hanging on the wall. And she told her students to use it as an object for their photography. She explained, the old plaster cast was hanging on the wall in the photography department. I asked the girls to use it as a subject, and they did atrocious things with it. They put a rose in its hair, and then they put scarves around it. I wanted to show them that they could take a simple subject like that and make the light really function. So I made these three photographs. So you see two of them here. And then the one on the right, illusion of male and female. And then the fourth in the series is this light follows form. Um, Alfred Stieglitz also played a role in how Corcoran's work took shape in the mid-1940s. She made the requisite pil pilgrimage to Stieglitz at his American Place Gallery in New York in the summer of 1945. During her visit with the dealer, Stieglitz had told her that her photographs, quote, changed the way he saw the world and indicated interest in showing her work. He penned this letter to Corcoran. This is at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art Archives. They have a wonderful um, archive of Corcoran and her correspondence. And it was one of these wonderful visionary letters that, that Stieglitz wrote to his friends. And he had seen a vision of her following her visit and wondered, had she photographed any more? This is Stieglitz in his American Place Gallery. 
Unfortunately, Stieglitz died in July 1946, and his widow, Georgia O'Keefe, in this letter, also at the Eamon Carter, informed Corcoran that her prince had arrived too late. She wrote, I opened your letter with the other mail after he was gone. He had said to me that he thought of showing your photographs, but I think he did not have the energy. He would want you to go on. It is the only way. Very dramatic. One wonders how Corcoran's biography would have changed had she been able to show her work at that time with Stieglitz. Stieglitz had not shown photographs at his gallery since an exhibition on Elia Porter in 1938. Corcoran carried on as O'Keefe had told her to do. Her investigations of light became more carefully controlled within the confines of her studio. One of her most successful series was realized in her dark room in 1948. Under the light of a mere 40 watt bulb, Corcoran placed six eggs in front of a curved iron plate, a ferrotype tin that she had bent. The eggs began to multiply and change shape on the ground glass of her 4 by 5 view camera. By the end of this session, Corcoran had made 30 negatives, which she then further manipulated by either cropping or enlarging or sometimes overlaying them. According to Corcoran, Kepesh also liked the eggs because he thought I was working in deep space. Kepesh thus dubbed the egg series Space Compositions. Um, also part of the series, um, Surly Faces and Strange Faces. She had wonderful titles for her works. Um, they were conceived with a glass bowl, a glass paperweight, and some liquor glasses that seemed to either move forward or recede in space. And reflecting um, from these glass bottles, you see these almost face, faces, and that's what she saw after she made it. And so after she printed these images, one of the faces in the image to the right, surly faces, I don't know which one it is, but I think it's that one right there. <laughs> um, she thought it bore an uncanny resemblance to Joseph Stalin. An apt visual reference to the Cold War rhetoric of the period, hence the title, Surly Faces. In this image, um, this is also has a wonderful title, A Figure Arose from Coral and Glass. And at this time, in 1949, she was using a fern coral. And for this study, she must have placed her curved, I don't know, my guess is she placed the curved ferrotype plate somehow in front of the glass, out of the camera's view. And as a result, this distorted reflection has almost these sort of attenuated tentacle-like curves, suggesting some sort of sinister creature rising up from the glass. And um, it's been noted by John Rohrbach and other people who've spoken um, over the past couple months about Corcoran. Um, she was very close friends with Clarence John Laughlin, a wonderful photographer who was based in New Orleans. And he was very into um, uh, Santeria and the occult. And he had wonderful titles for his images as well. So I wonder if she picked up this, um, this gift for titling from him. She considered her um, best series, aside from the eggs, um, her fluid light designs. And this one is called Wind Between the Worlds, which I believe is a title of an, a book at the time. Um, and she wants more return to the Venetian um, blind as her light modulator. But this time, she used the Venetian blind when it was almost shut. And these were all done sort of at dusk. Um, and the, these wonderful light patterns were created um, as a result of um, images, some prints that were on her table that had cellophane or plastic wrapped around them. And the light bouncing off of these books is how is the resulting image. That's what you see here. It's pretty um, amazing. Um, this particular image was selected for inclusion in the Abstraction in Photography exhibition at MoMA in New York in 1951, which was curated by Edward Steichen. Um, she then exhibited her work at the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts in Dallas in 1948, then headed by Jerry Bywaters, and the Art Institute in Chicago in 1953. 
Um, by around 1950, she had health problems, though it's never really been specified, but I think she was also taking care of elderly parents. So she had to choose between teaching or working in the dark room, and so she chose teaching. And she had considered herself, first and foremost, a teacher, and that she stated that she loved teaching above all else. So she continued um, doing photography, but mainly as classroom um, experiments for her, for her students. Um, as I mentioned, she was teaching um, how to do photograms uh, when Maholi Naj came in 1942. And this is from the collection of Jack and Beverly Wilgus here in Dallas, uh, probably made um, as a way to instruct her students how to make photograms. And um, she wrote an article in 1962 um, talking about how she taught her students. And um, she said that her students had to learn how to make uh, photograms in their first semester as a way to introduce abstract design. And for the assignment, um, they could choose from various materials, um, such as watch springs, rice grains, or pins, that would, um, they would either place on the, the paper and use flashlights to then expose the paper, or they could put the objects in an enlarger and make enlarger photograms. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Barbara Maples. She also learned how to make um, photograms from Corcoran, and she, um, of course, is primarily known as a printmaker, but she also had a compelling body of photography. And um, her education from Corcoran sort of came about because she was trying to learn how to make negatives um, to teach her um, students um, for slide presentations in the classroom. So between 1967 and 68, she would go up and visit Corcoran on the weekends. And uh, Corcoran um, encouraged her photographic experimentation. And this is Maple's work on the left, um, again, using just mundane objects. And like that image of the oil tank, um, Barbara um, took two negatives and sort of placed them side by side, and swapped them um, top to bottom to create this image. Another student that I've already mentioned was Beverly Wilgus. And she and her husband, Jack, have a substantial collection of photography, over 30,000 photographs. And these are being donated slowly um, to SMU's de Gaulier Library. And she was also a student of Corcoran um, from 1957 to 1960. Um, these were done as part of her master's thesis Corcoran uh, encouraged her, after she received her bachelor's, to go to the Institute of Design in Chicago. And she made these images here. And um, again, light is once more the theme. And unlike her teacher, um, Cor um, Wilgus used the figure in an abstract way. Corcoran, of course, had taken photographs of people, but never really um, experimented abstractly. Um, as Wilgus did here. So they're pretty interesting images, and these are also in the exhibition. Um, after she retired in 1968, Corcoran decided to revisit her own career as a photographer, or she, as she preferred to be called, a designer of light. And she sent some images to the San Francisco Museum of Art, and they were organizing an exhibition, uh, Women of Photography in 1975, and they accepted Corcoran's work. And there she was included in the show alongside Bernice Abbott, Imogen Cunningham, Loda Jacobi. And this helped propel her, in her finally, in her mid-70s, to become more broadly known. A year later, uh, Marcuse Pfeiffer, a New York dealer, um, began to represent Corcoran. And in one of these letters that's at the Eamon Carter, Corcoran told Kuzi Pfeiffer that she had over 50 negatives made several decades earlier that had never been enlarged. So um, Pfeiffer thus dubbed those images enlarged by Corcoran in the early 40, in the 40s and 50s vintage prints, um, while those that were printed in the 70s um, contemporary. 
Mrs. Corcoran in her later years. And these seven images come from Jerry Bywater's special collections. And I think, um, and Ellen Bowie Neewijk also thinks, that these are vintage prints. Um, these were given to the archive by Jerry Bywaters and Otis Dozier. And so it's very likely that these were gifts. Um, the eggs image um, was Jerry Bywaters, and the rest are from the Dozier collection. And um, we think probably that the eggs was made um, around the time of the 1948 exhibition at the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and Corcoran knew Velma Davis. Corcoran lectured for Velma, sorry, yeah, Velma Davis, who then became Vel Velma Dozier at the Dallas School of Creative Arts in 1937. So they all, of course, very likely knew each other. Janet Turner. Um, just as Corcoran subjugated nature to the primacy of light in varying degrees of abstraction, to create her own version of reality, Janet Turner displayed an absolute, absolute deference for nature, its power, its vulnerability, and its often fragile relationship with humankind, manifested in her intricate prints distinctive for their rhythmic and technical complexity. After she received a Bachelor of Arts in Far Eastern History from Stanford in 1936, she was unable to find employment during the Depression era um, she therefore um, enrolled one year later at the Art Institute in Kansas City. There she studied painting for five years with Thomas Hart Benton and pursued a minor in illustration and lithography under John De Martelli. After she received her diploma in 1941, she um, studied painting at Claremont College in California and earned her MFA in 1947. She then relocated to Nacogdoches and began her newly appointed role of assistant professor of art at Stephen F. Austin State College. Although she continued to paint once in Texas, she began to turn her focus to printmaking. Um, this was due to two things. Um, David Farmer gave such a wonderful lecture earlier this week at SMU, um, talking about how she was so busy teaching that she didn't have enough daylight to paint and so printmaking was a wonderful alternative um, for something that she could do during the evening. Um, the other reason was that she um, received the Guggenheim Fellowship in 1952 to study um, the flora and fauna along the Texas Gulf Coast. And the Guggenheim Fellowship was considered to be the turning point in her career, and it provided her the opportunity to study subjects in their natural habitats. And, um, her thesis was essentially to combine printmaking techniques, and that would become a lifelong hallmark of Turner. Um, this is about the Guggenheim Fellowship. Um, the, the press in Nekogdoches loved Turner, and she was often um, talked about in the press, much to the chagrin of the dean at the college at that time. He had told her that all of the press um, needs to first come through him. Um, this was this is from the archive at Nacogdoches. Um, just to give you an idea of how intense Janet Turner was, sometimes people bring her dead birds or small animals and she keeps them in the refrigerator for weeks, getting color and proportion correct. So, dedicated. Um, Black Vultures was part of this um, Guggenheim Fellowship work, and it was done in, in linocut, which was um, a new technique at that time, um, a relief technique similar to woodcut, but the design is cut into a linoleum block. And the artist took advantage of the graphic quality of the scene, the dark rafters picking over the bones, and um, there's a label in the archive in Nacogdoche, it's probably written by Turner, and she wrote that in order to achieve the tonal variations in gray, she created different levels of the linoleum block surface, which resulted in uneven inking. Another one was Bird of the Swamp. Um, it's a anhinga, um, is the, the name of the bird. And this is, a, more of a finished print. 
and these are images from the show. Um, Bywater Special Collections has five, all five of the blocks that were made um, for Bird of the Swamp. And these are some of the, the different prints here. And um, on the one on the top, you can see this eye here, um, and that was done in a technique called a la poupée. Um, so the blue ink was applied directly to the area of the matrix before the impression was pulled. Another one from the Guggenheim Fellowship was Stranded Roots and Etching. And um, this was conceived as both a watercolor and an etching and done in intaglio. And I think she chose intaglio in order to create this very sketch-like effect. And um, it's interesting to note that she used roots, which would become um, a repeated motif in her work. Another image from the Guggenheim Fellowship was Spoonbill, which was a combination of a woodcut and a serigraph, um, also known as silkscreen, which, of course, is a very ancient technique, um, probably invented in the Sung Dynasty um, in the 10th century. Um, but it got a new name in the late 1930s, or actually uh, late 19, early 1940s. The National Serigraph Society was founded in 1944, and they coined the term serigraphy. Um, Sera in Latin means silk, and graphy, of course, means writing. And um, it was renamed, essentially, to distinguish the technique from its earlier utilitarian associations. So Turner went in 1949 to study serigraphy with Edward Landon. Um, and he, she incorporated the new printing process frequently throughout her career. And her mastery of silkscreen at mid-century predates the techniques sort of discovery by Andy Warhol, who, beginning in the 1960s, capitalized on the medium's mass-produced appeal. Turner's facility with silkscreen was well known, and she went in Japan, to Japan in 1954 to visit the studio of Kiyoshi Saito. And she exhibited her works in a one-woman exhibition there at the Yoseido Gallery. And she was so proficient um, in the technique that she was asked in Japan to give a demonstration of silkscreen technique to their artists there. While she was teaching in Nakagdoches, um, she, these are some other examples of her silkscreen technique. Um, this uh, is an image of the powerhouse being constructed on campus. And so she delved somewhat from nature as her subject. Um, she was also concerned with social structures. Um, so this is one example. Um, and if that is an, a construction, as she called it, this could be considered a deconstruction. Um, it's a depiction of crumbling stairs. Um, and it was inspired by a uh, destruction of a mansion in Philadelphia in a neighborhood called the Main Line. And um, this, as a watercolor, was her watercolor version was published in Time Magazine in 1952. And at that time, she was ranked as among the best artists of her generation working in Texas. And this is also in the show. It's a four-color silk screen of a Brahma bull. Um, and the Brahma bulls were imported to Texas in the, the 19th century. This, unfortunately, is not in the show, but I wanted to talk about it um, because uh, when she made this work, she was criticized um, by art critics who said, you know, we're living in the 20th century net right now. And of course, this was the heyday of abstract expressionism. And her remark was that the print reflects my personal reaction to the rootless ones who deny all values of the past and see only the most recent faddish social forms as those representative of today. The armadillo is poor of sight, has poor hearing, is stupid. And this touch hide this um, tough-hided creature 
is thriving today in this confused world. Um, and again, the image on the left is in our exhibition, the one on the right is not, but I wanted to bring it in um, to talk about, it's called guinea fowl, um, but nature was her subject, but it was also her language, and she used a lot of sort of veiled metaphors through nature. Um, the guinea fowl was symbolic. She um, witnessed how birds competed to get to the uppermost roosting spot in a tree. And to a very restricted audience, she called this um, print, quote, the climbing conformists, who, when they reach the top, can't stand the winds of exposure. And she was speaking about uh, the faculty at Stephen F. Austin, who unfortunately, um, the dean was encouraging all of the teachers to stop um, working um, in sort of realistic work and, and start um, working in abstract art. And Janet Turner was very familiar with abstract art and she could do it, and there are a few examples of it, but that wasn't her, that's not what she was interested in. And so then we turn to the lost snail, and you can see kind of this relationship and who might have been feeling like a lost snail at that time. Um, and it's another example of her symbolism. Um, but it was noted in her catalog resume that she later wondered, quote, whether one who carried his home with, his, with him could ever be lost. Again, without purpose, um, these sort of roots become, again, the motif. And at this time, she took a leave of absence from Stephen F. Austin to pursue a doctorate of art education from Teachers College at Columbia. And this change allowed the artist to become more involved with art movements taking pla place on the East Coast. She was active with the National Serograph Society, and she also was a teaching assistant for a printmaking course. And perhaps as a result of her exposure to um, a number of printmaking methods, um, she seems to have experimented at this time even more. She began working a lot more with lithography. She had more access um, to the tools she needed for lithography. And she hadn't really used it since the late 1930s. Um, this image of a deteriorating limb, tree limb, reinvokes the tree motif. Here the symbol often associated in Turner's work with stability and tenacity possibly relates to her feelings of disenfranchisement um, in, with East Texas University politics. And so she took leave. I wanted to bring this in. This is not in the show, but this was um, included in an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1950. So she was well known for, um, she was uh, well exhibited, she received numerous awards for her work. Uh, Thomas Hart Benton had encouraged her um, when she was at the Art Institute to, to show her work constantly and she received awards all of the time. Uh, she received her doctorate in art education and um, re uh, got a job at Chico State University in California in 1959. She became assistant professor in art education and um, began working a lot more with intaglio. And these two images are in the show. Um, and the matrix for this print is in California at the Janet Turner Print Museum, which is on the campus of Chico State University. Uh, it began as a mezzo tint here at 1959 and continued through various stages this is from the 1970s. And she just continued working on the matrix, um, working deeper into it to make it more three-dimensional um, to sort of underscore the, the decay of the animal. Uh, this is also in the show. This is from the Bywaters. Um, all of our works on Turner in the show are from Bywater Special Collections. And this is a beautiful, um, matrix for a print she made called Iguana in the mid-1970s. 
And you can see the quality of her workmanship. It's, it's unbelievable, it's phenomenal. And these are two um, examples. Um, at the bottom here is actually a collage. I'm not sure what else to call it, but it's, it's two prints of the work. Um, the perch was cut out of one and put on the bottom, and then the part of the animal on the second print was sort of um, pasted on top. And um, some of it was colored during the printing, and some of it's hand colored. And you can see it better um, if you come this afternoon. And this is a print from the matrix. And some of these lines down the animal's back, um, those don't correspond exactly with the matrix. So she did a lot of coloring after the print was pulled. And then there's this um, wonderful image. It's a huge print um, made in the mid-70s, a lino cut, wood cut, silk screen. And it took her about a year to get through this edition. Um, at the bottom it says EV, which means edition variable. So every single print of this edition was different. She would print it. Um, but of course she was very inspired um, by a Japanese woodblock technique. And um, it's hard to see in the slide, but there's this beautiful gradation of color as you go down the print. And um, it, it looks a lot like um, Japanese woodblock technique, um, moku honga, which was uh, water-based pigments rather than oil-based. Because of this beautiful ombre technique, um, she either worked in that sort of technique when she used this, or she was um, making it like that. Um, and in the background, you see the wood grain of the, the woodblock. Uh, and it's just a, it's a very gorgeous work of art. Turner retired from Chico State in 1983, and she continued to create, create until cancer took her life in 1988. She was fundamental in elevating the art of printmaking for future practitioners. She left a for, rich 40-year legacy of her own printed work and made printmaking's creative uh, potential seem almost limitless. She began donating her own collection of prints to Chico State in 1980. By the time of her death, it, the number stood at 2,000, and now um, there are over 4,000 prints in that collection. And Dr. David Farmer, who spoke earlier this week at SMU, talked about how she would visit this particular print shop, and she bought um, not the greatest print by a pretty good artist, and he said, oh, no, no, you don't want that. And she said, no, I want it. And she said, he said, but it's not good, and she said, well, how do my students know what not to do if they don't have examples of it? <laughs> so she had a very sort of democratic approach um, to her teaching. Um, both of these artists, Corcoran and Turner, pushed boundaries in their chosen media. They were fully cognizant of their artistic pre predecessors, but yet they were unwilling to acquiesce to artistic conventions of their own day. Um, they stayed true to their own aesthetics, and they were both recognized in their own lifetime for their contributions and their influence um, on future practitioners of their media was immeasurable. And that's it.